Hello, this is uh, Diane Sayers Symposium. Today is uh, December 8th, Friday, December 8th, and we're kicking off today uh, a three-part series on uh, American history, uh, specifically many different facets of the history that has been stolen from us, and fr from us as American citizens with a particular understanding of the special significance of the spirit of the law of the U.S. Constitution as it pertains to the concept of, uh, of the natural dignity of humankind and the, the, the actual application of, of that natural law at all times beyond any treasonous or tyrannical uh, form of government that may have uh, power uh, as we speak. And so in this context of this three-part uh, series that we're kicking off, uh, I'd like to let you know that we actually had a very large deployment out at the UN today because, as you know, as you may know, last night or yesterday, Antonio Gutierrez, in his uh, capacity as the, as the Secretary General of the UN, invoked Article 99 of the UN Charter to convene a special session of the UN Security Council to call for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. And as was expected, as we expected, as anybody who knows the the, U the United States position in regard to this particular issue. Uh, this, this, uh, call, this call for a vote was uh, vetoed by the United States today after the call was postponed from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And so what we saw was a vote of 13 in favor, uh, one abstaining, which was the United Kingdom, and one against, which was the United States. And the speech that the representative of the United States gave at the UN was essentially a repetition of the rhetoric that you hear in the mainstream media in the United States and among all of the people who listen to this uh, mainstream media and take it as their uh, definition of what is possible. So he basically made the argument, which is something that we've heard from the likes of Hillary Clinton, which is that to stop killing the civilians in Gaza would be a cause of war. In other words, their logic is completely inverted they live in a world where not killing civilian civilians, not bombing houses full of children, not leaving countless, literally untold numbers of people suffocating under piles of rubble, that is the thing that would, according to their logic, support terrorism. Stopping that would be in support of terrorism. So that's the, that's the worldview, that's the, the concept of what is real that we're dealing with in the the, 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 ruling, the ruling order, the people who actually use the veto power of, the, the, United, of the, the official international body of international law, this is the concept of reality that they are using to determine their judgments. So it's obviously a very concerning situation in that regard because they, 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 there doesn't seem to be any alternative that they are willing to acknowledge except for the extermination of Hamas which, as we know, is equivalent to the continued depopulation of Gaza, the continued unmitigated murder of innocent civilians, including uh, journalists, doctors, uh, among, of course, an entire other cross-section, the rest of the cross-section of the, of the population. And the, the numbers of the people that, that have been killed reaching over, well over 15,000 at this point in Gaza is, of course, only a sort of uh, inaccurate estimate of the people that have been uh, directly killed by the impact of the bombs. It does not account for the far-reaching and long-lasting effects of the famine and the, uh, and the epidemics that naturally arise in populations that have been displaced and have been deprived of basic humanitarian needs such as electricity and water. So it's uh, certainly a disheartening news uh, for anybody who has a conscience uh, and it's in, in light of that that we, that we are trying to educate on this very specific and critical, this very specific and critical question, which is how is it that the, the United States, the republic that holds up the banner of universal law that was, that sounded the sort of clarion call of natural law as the basis for governance, not that this was ever something that was perfectly implemented, but how is it that this government has come to be transformed into the world hegemon 
imperial power. And so my, my friend Suzanne Klebe is going to give a presentation about how some of this relates to the, the role of uh, essentially British propaganda in terms of World War, World War I and the, and the allegiance that was formed even so far as back as the beginning of the 20th century uh, in between the, the British Empire and the, and the sort of, and the, the United States government, but really the United States population seemingly has, has been repeatedly sort of um, blackmailed and cajoled into a sort of complicit silence with regard to the various machinations of, in, of these imperial powers throughout essentially its entire history. Um, so Suzanne will get into that, but before that, hopefully, hopefully here soon, Diane will be uh, arriving. And there's just another um, important initiative that I want to mention here with regard to Diane's campaign, because Diane's campaign is, is essentially the only campaign, the only national campaign in the United States right now that is carrying the moral legitimacy and the, the technical capacity of an actual presidential candidacy. Uh, we were just last night at an event with Cornell West, who is a presidential candidate running as an independent, uh, and he was in conversation with Norman Finkelstein. Norman Finkelstein is considered the foremost scholar on Gaza and the plight of the Palestinian people under the uh, long occupation of the state of Israel. And it was an interesting conversation in that Norman Finkelstein was uh, was asking f very direct questions of Cornell West and was clearly actually trying to get at whether or not it was possible for Cornell West to have have a have a, a a meaningful impact with his with his presidential candidacy and Cornell West who at least in my opinion does have very interesting things to say about American culture and American history and he does very clearly have a, have a certain moral uh, uh, stance that he holds holds true to, and this, the same could very much be said of Norman Finkelstein, but nonetheless, uh, Cornell West's general mode as a politician is, as he himself explains, is that of a, is based on the metaphor of jazz music. And so his sort of hermetic rhetoric which is largely based in the sort of concept of, uh, of a self, of a sort of self-enclosed counterculture, leads him to not necessarily always speak directly to the issues. And so we saw it when almost all the questions that were asked, he did have a sort of roundabout way of answering them. And that was especially true when Diane Sayre stood up and said, I have a question. And, uh, she, she pressed him on the issue of, of actually not, not just running for president, but assuming, the, assuming the, the responsibility of the presidency. And this was something that seemed to be either entirely lost on him or something that he didn't really want to address directly uh, at the time because there was a sort of awkward pause after she asked her question, which the question was, she, she suggested to him something along the lines of convening a, a people's movement at the UN in, in imitation or in, in, in reference to the kind, of, the kind of movement that was led by Martin Luther King Jr. shortly after his Riverside speech at the UN, drawing a popular movement to the, to the international body, calling for, calling for an end to the conflict with the moral force of the actual population. When Diane suggested that to him, there was sort of an awkward silence. So another question was actually allowed to be asked before he even addressed it, before he even addressed Diane's question. And then by the time he got around to it, he kind of brushed it off with, a, with about a 10 second mm -hmm. remark. So it was, a, it, was a very strange, it was a very strange evening in the sense that it, as, as, as the, as the, as the Q&A unfolded, and I think particularly as Diane's intervention played out, it became pretty clear that he, that Cornell West wasn't really prepared to assume the, that kind of radical responsibility of the presidency, um, and and uh, well, Diane's here now, so maybe I can just pass it off. But it was uh, it was it was it was certainly an interesting evening. And can I pass it off to you now?
if you want to. Yeah, sure. I mean, what I mean, the, the, I was just saying that the um, when that we were at the the Cornell West Finkelstein event, and that the other thing that Sarah, that Diane Sayre suggested was for for Norman Finkelstein, who has a lot of publicity right now, to help us in our current campaign to get Columbia University to recognize that it's actually a moral travesty that they have Hillary Clinton on their, uh, on their faculty. And this, this was just not even, it was not even recognized as a, as a legitimate question. In other words, it doesn't seem, despite much of his bluster, that Cornell West is really interested in challenging the status quo in the manner that I think Diane Sayre is really trying to do. So with that, I'll pass it off to you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Should I put this on? Should I put this on? Does that help? OK. You're not staying here? Oh, I can't. OK, it doesn't matter, uh, as long as I'm visible. OK. So. Um, I'm glad to be here. I know Robert covered this vote, but I just have to say, you have to think about how the United States looks in the eyes of the world. The entire world wants a <coughs> ceasefire. The entire world is horrified by the photographs, videotapes, reports. This is not, uh, when the United States killed a million people in Iraq in 2003, it wasn't on Facebook. Now everybody is aware of what's happening and we can listen to the reports. I was listening to an interview the other day of a young woman who described her cousin had 23 members of their family killed. And she, descri and she described one family member was badly injured and spent the last four days of his life finding out that everyone else died and then died, right? And, and that is the horror that's going on. Uh, and what, so everybody, and how could you say no to a ceasefire? That's the thing that I find unbelievably barbaric and stupid. Who doesn't want a ceasefire? If, I mean, just by definition, that means you want people to keep killing each other. Isn't that the first law of nature, let alone the first commandment, thou shalt not kill? So the idea of saying, if we stop killing, Hamas has won, and, and exactly what did they win? <laughs> is Israel not going to exist? It's a total lie, and, and you have the most insane, absolutely insane stuff going around. So the British, as always, it, it's like such a sucker punch, right? The Brits don't veto the, the ceasefire. The Brits abstain and let the U.S. veto it because then they can keep the spotlight on the U.S. as the empire of evil and the ori originator of the policy when the whole policy was made in London. But that's not to say we're not to blame. So our nation now has lost all credit. We have no moral authority. And that's why I've been saying, if you don't want the United, either the, the situation right now is the best possible case. In the best case, the United States is going to disintegrate. It's going to be like a crumbling, dead Roman Empire that is completely irrelevant, where the rest of the world kind of shrugs and says, yeah, those you know barbarians. The life expectancy will go down to 22, and uh, I mean, that's where we're headed. That would be the best outcome. Since we are arrogant, since our leaders are arrogant and deluded, they don't intend to allow that. They would rather nuke the entire planet first. So you have to also bear in mind that Biden announced the deployment of the B-6112 gravity bomb, which is a dial-a-bomb with a GPS system. 
So you can say, oh, it's totally under our control. Mm -hmm. We can hit our target accurately. You, we can have a limited nuclear war. Mm -hmm. So it's actually unbelievably dangerous, and it's the immorality of the people of the United States that have allowed this. Now, I uh, dug up an article from Executive Intelligence Review, Lyndon LaRouche's magazine, um, written by Paul Gallagher with a press release from Lyndon LaRouche, because it turns out that the Israeli newspaper Haaretz of January 25th, 2002, published an interview with an anonymous IDF soldier who said, we are being trained in the tactics of what the Nazis did in the Warsaw Ghetto. Now, the Warsaw Ghetto, 300,000 Jews were expelled, massacred, sent to concentration camps. 60,000, this is where they made the ammunition for the Nazis. They had Jews producing their ammunition, a little bit like you know, we have Russians and Chinese Russians are producing the rockets for our missiles and things like that. So at any rate, uh, these Jews were armed and they decided to fight. And it was interesting because what Norman Finkelstein described was his mother had been in the Warsaw Ghetto and he very clearly is grappling with the parallel of people in their basements making ammunition to fight the Nazis and Hamas being in the tunnels to fight the Israeli fascists who have been oppressing and torturing Palestinians for the last many decades. But he also said something which I thought was very insightful, um, which is he hopes Hamas doesn't win, but he doesn't want Israel to win because the issue is, you don't want to create a precedent where it's actually force that determines the outcome of a situation. That's the problem. Because frankly, that's not true in the long term. It's not force. It's, it's whoever is more coherent with natural law that determines the outcome, not force. But at any rate, so the way the Nazis dealt with the last 60,000 Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto who were totally dug in was house to house, brutal fighting, flooding basements. Okay, exactly what the Israeli Defense Forces are doing in Gaza now. And this general, this Nazi general Stroop, wrote a whole report about it. And this is what the IDF was studying in their tactics against Gaza. So that's true. So Lyndon LaRouche then wrote a press release called Gutter Damerung in Palestine, Gutter Damerung, The Twilight of the Gods. This is a famous opera by Wagner when Zeus gets in a rage fit because he's lost control of the world and therefore decides that rather than lose power, he's going to destroy, he's going to destroy civil, he's going to destroy everything. Um, and LaRouche says at the beginning of this release, someone must stick his neck out to bring this raging Middle East horror to a close. At the present moment, the Israeli efforts to eradicate the Palestinians are the principal detonator for a potential worldwide continuing religious and ethnic warfare, a war from which no nation, no person can be safe. He could have written this yesterday. This is 2002. And then he talks about uh, the question that this Jabotinsky, what he represented, this is a fascist tradition in Israel. It is not a Jewish tradition. It is a fascist tradition, which is the same tradition as Samuel Huntington, Zbigniew Brzezinski, or what you call universal fascism. And it has nothing to do with uh, the religion per se. In fact, I would say just like the Spanish Inquisition completely 
destroyed, if it had become dominant, that would have destroyed Christianity. This kind of fascism would destroy anything that was worthwhile in Judaism. Uh, and he said, that's really what we are, that's really what we're up against. That's what we're up against in the United States. Who is making this genocide possible? The United States. There have been 200 cargo plane loads of weapons, primarily from the US, the UK, elsewhere, that have been flown into Israel since they started their extermination campaign. So we have to take the gloves off on this, on what it is. There are many people I know who are good and reasonable people, so I thought, who for some reason think that there is any justification for killing what is now approaching 20,000 civilians, over half of whom are children. And there is none. There is absolutely none. This is not going to stop the violence. Anyone who says, oh, we just have to kill them all is an idiot. It's moronic. We said that about Iraq. Iraq had absolutely nothing to do with 9-11. We killed a million people who had nothing to do with harming us and no intention of harming us. And we made a lot of enemies doing that. And now Iraq, which never had Al-Qaeda in it, has become an ungovernable mess. And similarly, Hillary Clinton's gloating cackle, more like a teenage girl giggle, over the horrifically brutal death of Gaddafi with what resulted from that. It indicates something really rotten. So as I said in Syracuse, I have to say, the jury is out if civilization makes it, but civilization is more likely to make it than the United States is to make it. And the key is if the United States can return to its actual mission which hardly anyone knows, certainly very few people under the age of 35 know anything about it because the history has been destroyed. And that's why we thought we would take this period, the three weeks leading into Christmas, the anniversary of Washington crossing the Delaware, to discuss some aspects of the actual intent of the Republic. And so that's why Suzanne is going to tell us the story of how this confusion developed mm -hmm. and how the British, see, isn't it funny? They say the victor writes the history. Well, the British Empire lost, mm -hmm. and they still got to write the history. Yeah. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over mm -hmm. to Suzanne. How exciting. Yes, I, I think. Um, the, the reason is that the American Revolution... They can't hear you. Uh, yeah. Oh, I've got it. pretty shocking times, I have to say, and, and you do realize when you talk about these things and what's happening that uh, winning a war is not what you might think. Um, the British are very good at this because they're real, they're, they're very steeped in, in culture and history and, you know, they, they, they're, they're interested in how you control populations uh, through their history, whereas People tend to think, you know, that, that it doesn't work that way. And I, I'm just thinking of it because if you can get someone to adopt the policy that they seemingly were fighting against, then that's victory. So this whole question of the Nazi period, if you can get the people who were destroyed by the Nazis to adopt the same thinking themselves and implement Nazi-type policies, that is, from their standpoint, success. 
because it's not just that you win a war by killing a lot of people or taking territory, but it's basically the question of the control of the mind. That's really what these things are about. And the American Revolution was uh, extremely significant in that way because it was a question of culture, to create a culture which was anti-oligarchical, which actually opposed the idea of oligarchical dominance and said uh, that, you know, said quite explicitly that uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. You know, pretty powerful. Uh, and that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights and that these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's our revolution. So if you can get people with that revolution to then do the kind of things that we've been doing in overthrowing governments, And from the British standpoint, that's victory. You've destroyed the actual culture and uh, the, the, the ideas of the revolution. Now, if we can reverse that, uh, it's going to have enormous significance. And that's really what we really have to do, but I think we have to put it in that context. So I have slides, so if we can set these up. I'm going to start with the first one. Um, okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, what is it? <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> Michelle read it. Well, what, yeah, it's evacuation day. It was one of the most celebrated holidays in the United States for at least 100 years. Uh, and as we all know, most people in the room had absolutely no idea what this was. Uh, evacuation meant the British were being kicked out of New York and being out of the country. New York was the center mm -hmm. of British control after, you know, after the, the uh, evacuation out of Brooklyn and so forth. From that point on, the British controlled everything they did out of New York City. Uh, and when the revolution succeeded, uh, they had a leave. And so it was a big point of celebration that they actually had a leave. It took time, they had to pull together all the loyalists, they had to get the people out who had collaborated with them and so forth. But when it was finally ready to go, and when it was sure that they were in the boats and they were leaving, then Washington came from where he was, more up around Harlem and North, and moved into the city. And they had this huge celebration. Now, what the poll is, is the British, not really wanting to leave, uh, you know, uh, refused to take down their flag. So the flag still remained, and Washington said he wouldn't come into the city until the flag was gone, the British flag was gone. So what the British did is they greased this pole so you couldn't get up and remove their flag. Uh, so that was, you know, part of what they did. Their flag was up there. You couldn't go up. And then this Von Arsdale uh, figured out how to put cleats on the pole, climbed up the pole, pulled down the British flag, put up the American flag. That's evacuation day. It, it typifies this. After that, there were days of celebration uh, at the local tavern. One of the articles talks about how much wine and, and so forth was in, imbibed, which was uh, quite extensive. Uh, and they gave, they gave different uh, toasts. And I want to read, oh, read one of the toasts because, again, we all realize we didn't know what it was, right? <laughs> so the last toast they gave is that, may the remembrance of this day be a lesson to princes. <laughs> but we don't remember it. <laughs> now, why is that? Why is that? What happened to Evacuation Day? A, a funny story is when Diane was beginning her campaign against Schumer, we wanted to do something for Evacuation Day, and uh, I contacted some of the people who were connected to the Sons of the American Revolution and all this, and I said, well, you know, they have a small event that we wanted to participate in that. And uh, the, the thing was they were inviting people from the British mission to be there. <laughs> I said, isn't that a little odd, you know? 
Uh, no, no, you know, I mean, there's really no, you know, we're all friends, right? Okay, so. Oh, is this better? Okay. Oh, that's much better. Okay. So go to the, go to the next slide, and you'll see here. Uh, we'll just run through these because I have too many. <laughs> uh, the next slide is Washington coming into the city. That's, there he is. And the next slide is evacuation day. This is just an example of these ongoing celebrations. Uh, schools were off, military units, fire parades, you know, everything took place for days every single year to celebrate evacu evacuation day until uh, 1916. And that was the last evacuation day, and I'll tell you why. Okay, so let's go to the next one. We'll just jump through here. These are the kind of celebrations that took place uh, to celebrate that the British were gone and keep going. And uh, one of the people who has written extensively about this is a historian whose name is Edwin Burroughs. And Burroughs, uh, can keep going, uh, Dave. Dave, keep going. Next slide. Oh, OK. OK, is the one before that? Burroughs wrote this famous book called Gotham which he won a Pulitzer Prize for. And I'm pointing this out because these are very serious historians, he and his friend Wallace. Uh, Gotham on New York is uh, 1,400 pages. Uh, so you think he knows everything, right? OK, next slide. But what he said is he didn't. And he wrote this book called Forgotten Patriots, the untold story of the American prisoners during the Re Revolutionary War. And what this was about was the prison ships off the coast of uh, Brooklyn, Wallabout Bay, 16 ships, where more people died as prisoners of the British than died in the Revolution, in all the battles combined. The brutality of the British was extraordinary. And uh, what Burroughs said is, I'm a famous historian. <laughs> I won a Pulitzer Prize. I'm from Brooklyn. Why didn't I know what had happened? The next slide, in, in the beginning of the book, he talks about uh, a guy who moved into an area in New York City a little bit after the Revolution. The sugar houses were another place where prisoners were held, and they were also really terrible. Uh, and they, at one point, they finally decided to pull them down, you know, and... Okay, so they had they uh, they they destroyed one of the the sugar houses, and the person who Burroughs he was reading his papers, he said he called it historicide. You know, the killing of history, and he said this is really bad because it'll come the time that nobody will remember what actually happened. Next slide, and with the prison ships, uh, that's exactly the case, and. Uh, and Burroughs takes this up. So this is one of the most notorious prison ships called the Jersey. And you can see up there the people who were held in there who were dying. Uh, 11,500 people died on these ships, uh, which is, uh, they were something like, uh, they think, and Burroughs thinks there was a lot, there were a lot more. Keep going. This is Wallaby Bay. You see it's sort of curved over there on the right. Keep going, that's where they were. And they remain there. The Jersey remained there even after the Revolution. It was just rotting, uh, you know, right there off Wallabout Bay. And all the bones, they were still picking up bones all over the shore of people who had died on the boats. A lot of them had been just tossed overboard. Uh, every night, the people on the ships were told to go take the dead people off and bury them. They'd take a boat, they'd dig a little thing, you know, in the water, it wasn't very deep, they'd bury it, the bodies would come up again. Uh, it, was, it was really brutal. And Burroughs says he had, uh, the numbers were much larger than he thought, he anticipated that approximately 18,000 Americans were thought to have been captured by the British from 1775 to 1783, of whom 47% were said to have died by disease and starvation. 
uh, for reasons that will become clear. He said he thinks it's 30,000, 60 percent died. Any way you look at it, it's at least twice the number who are said to have died in the revolution itself, which is about 6,800. Uh, go ahead. Next slide. And uh, he continues from there. He, he said, it's a mean, ugly story. It's also a story that enlarges our understanding of how the United States was made, not merely by bewigged gentlemen who thought deeply, talked well, and wrote gracefully, but also by thousands upon thousands of mostly ordinary people who believed in something they considered worth dying for. Uh, they discuss that at a certain point, the British would offer you a way to get off the boat if you swore allegiance to the king, uh, which people generally refuse to do. Uh, keep going. Uh, so this is a monument that was built in 1908. Now, they collected the bones, and they had several smaller monuments. This one is another monument that nobody really knows <laughs> what it is. It's in Fort Greene Park, which is in Brooklyn. Uh, it commemorates the people who died, and they collected the bones and they interred them here. When they built this monument in 1908, there was a huge celebration. Uh, next slide. And you can see here is uh, the, the uh, program. I mean, they had, you know, all sorts of people, they had uh, honor guards, they had everything else for this celebration about, you know, about this event. The monument was created by some of the most, you know, important architects and so forth. The park was designed by Olmsted, who designed Central Park, and uh, how, uh, William Howard Taft spoke, you know, who was a presidential candidate, um, and, you know, it was widely uh, covered. Taft, in his speech, said the following. Around three, it was raining. He said, around three o'clock, as the rain became a mixture of sleet and snow and marchers continued to pour into the park, Taft rose to deliver the principal address. The president-elect delivered a surprisingly frank denunciation of British, quote, cruelty and neglect, outrageous and indefensible cruelty, revolting to every instinct of human nature. Uh, and they continue from this. He said he didn't think that the t deaths of thousands of helpless Americans had been intended or premedicated. Such a charge would make the British commanders human monsters, but the officers in charge clearly failed in their duty to protect the human beings whose lives, as they must have known, were being sacrificed from day to day by the awful uh, environment in which they were compelled to live. So th this was a statement made uh, by the president-elect, and yet, Within a matter of years, this is also no longer really recognized. By 1921, they actually turned off the lantern uh, and so forth. Now, why did this happen? Okay, keep, keep going. Well, you know, Burroughs says, what happened? You know, why did this happen? Well, he said, first of all, maybe, let me investigate. Maybe the story that all these people died and all this happened, maybe it didn't really happen. Okay, so let's look at that. So he looks at that, he comes to the conclusion, it's incredibly well documented it happened. Okay, two, well, maybe it happened, but you know, people didn't know what was happening. And he said, well, it was very well known. Uh, there were newspaper reports, people who got out wrote uh, testaments of what had happened. Ethan Allen wrote something, you know, he was a prisoner. And Ben Franklin and Lafayette wrote about it. In fact, when Lafayette went back to, uh, to Europe and met with Ben Franklin, they discussed writing a book about it, you know, a scrapbook with pictures that could be widely circulated. Uh, and then, you know, so that, you know, he said, well, it's very well known. And then the third thing is something we'll go into as we continue. So next slide. So this is what it looked like in there. And I'm just going to read you a description. Uh, which I think you've already gotten the idea, but I'll just, this is from one of the people who did write a report, just to show there were lots of reports about what the conditions were. This was 1778 in the Connecticut Gazette. He said, the heat was so intense that the 300 plus prisoners were all naked, which also served the well to get rid of vermin, but the sick were eaten up alive. Their sickly countenances and ghastly looks were truly horrible, some swearing and blaspheming, others crying, praying, wringing their hands, and stalking about like ghosts, others delirious, raving and storming, all panting for breath, 
some dead and corrupting. The air was so foul that at times a lamp could not be kept burning, by reason of which the bodies were not missed until they had been dead for 10 days. One person alone was admitted on deck at a time after sunset, which occasioned much filth to run into the hole and mingle with the bilge water. Even the victuals uh, were deadly. Prisoners were forced to subsist on moldy bread, rancid meat of suspect provenance and soup cooked in huge copper cauldrons with water from the East River. So that's a direct report. Next. And you know that's what I just read you, I think. Keep going. This was another report, Ethan Allen, very, very famous, had a huge following. He writes about his captivity. Next. And then Franklin and Lafayette. You know, as I said, Mar uh, Lafayette goes there in 1779, gives Franklin a direct report. Next slide. And uh, they propose a book. So, you know, the thing about the book, uh, and I probably shouldn't, anyway, I mean, uh, Franklin discusses what should be in the book, and he just again talks about, you know, the barbarous nature of all this and so, so forth. Uh, and he said we should do this to show people and children in the next generations the insatiable malice and wickedness uh, and, uh, and what was done. Next. Ed Burroughs says, like many of his countrymen, Franklin had come to see the apparently systemic mistreatment of American prisoners as a kind of moral or psychological Rubicon. Once crossed, there could be no compromise, no turning back no restoration of the connection between the colonies and the mother country. Uh, and then he says, you know, when the war was over and independence assured, he would look back on the refusal of thousands of ordinary men to abandon the cause while in captivity, even at the cost of their lives, as glorious testimony in favor of plebeian virtue. Next. So again, you know, we, we see it was it happened, it was well documented, uh, major figures were commenting and so forth. So we come to the next point. <laughs> Why, again, do people not know this if all this is the case? And three is the Espionage Act, World War I. Uh, so at the, the point that Franklin says we can never be reconciled, that's his statement. Next slide. We get 1917 when the U.S. joins uh, Britain for World War I. And he says, on April 6, 1917, Congress declared war on Germany and the United States in the, and in the 141st year of its independence became Great Britain's de facto ally. After 141 years, we're now allied with the people we said we could never reconcile with. Next. Now, the Espionage Act uh, was passed uh, to debate, you know, by the Wilson administration and so forth. And you can see it was pomp, uh, prompted by the Anglophobia, which existed. I mean, a lot of people didn't support the British. We had a revolution. We had these whole questions of the uh, oligarchical system, the brutality of it. And also, you had very large Irish, German, and other populations. Uh, so Congress followed up the declaration of war with passage of this act. The harsh and sweeping measure made it a federal offense, punishable by death or by a stiff fine and up to 30 years in jail, to publish or utter anything that would tend to aid the enemy, interfere with recruiting, or promote insubordination and disloyalty in the armed forces. This would extend these provisions to prohibit disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the government. Now, this, this Espionage Act is again and has been in the headlines because it's been used against Assange or threatened to use against Assange. Uh, it was used against Daniel Ellsberg with the uh, Pentagon Papers. And it's, uh, you know, there's, uh, it's been used recently, it was actually succeeded in being used against none other but uh, Nathan Hale's great-great-grandson or something who's been prosecuted under this for exposing what was going on with drones. But what you're looking at here is a little different, and this ties into the way the British got to write the history of the American Revolution, which is they said that if you attack the British, or if you actually talk about what happened in the Revolution from the standpoint of the brutality of the British, that this 
was a uh, a crime against the uh, against the, uh, the against the Espionage Act. So next next uh, slide. And uh, you know a wave of prosecutions ensued, leaving no doubt they wanted to suppress not only anti-war but anti-British feeling. Hundreds of radicals went to prison. Seventy-five newspapers, many written for German American or Irish American newspapers, were either banned from the mails or forced to stop publishing war news. Sounds familiar, right? A little bit. Next slide. Uh, and um, you know, when the British were pumping all sorts of, of material in, which not only attacked the Germans as being brutal, but what they began to really push was all these songs of praise to the Anglo-Saxon democracy, amiable references to the American Revolution. Oh, the British like the American Revolution now. One writer dubbed it a single regrettable incident caused by, quote, the most muddle-headed ministry that ever mismanaged the affairs of Great Britain. You know, in books, pamphlets, lectures, and college classrooms, leading academic historians encouraged Americans to see that their ancient animosity for the British stemmed from ignorance and prejudice. Publishers scrambled to correct the nation's history texts accordingly, rewriting passages that seemed critical of Britain or had good things to say about Germany. Uh, in New York, the annual observance of, of evacuation day was ended. Now, there's some really great quotes by, by Burroughs of these so-called historians at coming to terms and getting people to understand we should rewrite the history books. This includes very famous, famous historians like Samuel Morrison, you know, who wrote the history of the Navy. I mean, the gist of it was let's let bygones be bygones. Most of this stuff was blown out of, uh, you know, out, uh, blown up. Uh, one woman said, why should we criticize the British when we all have the same blood? You know, <laughs> and we have to work together. Next. Next slide. Now, this ex extended into cases which were really quite something, including this, a, a filmmaker whose name was Goldstein, who was found guilty under the Espionage Act, he, was, he produced a film, and he was affected by the verdict, he asked for a new trial, and so on and so forth. Now, the film was called The Spirit of 76. It was about the American Revolution. Uh, when the court case occurred, you know, for under the, the, uh, the Espionage Act, the title of the case was The United States of America Against Versus the Spirit of 76. Which is a real <laughs> neat title. Okay, keep going. Now, this is uh, the United States versus the 76. This, this cover here is written by a film historian whose name is Anthony Slide, who, I mean, the, the film no longer exists, but he wrote the book on it. He went and got all the documents, the court case, you know, what was tried and so forth. Uh, we spoke to him. It's, he's, it's, it's very interesting. When I spoke to him the first time, his whole take was that this is Assange. You know, he could just see the similarities and so forth. But go ahead. Uh, now, what, the, what uh, Burroughs says of this is the danger of recollecting British atrocities during the revolution itself became apparent only a month after the U.S. declaration of war when a 14-reel epic film, The Spirit of 76, premiered in Chicago. In April of 1918, arguments uh, got underway in Los Angeles. Two weeks later, they found Goldstein guilty on all counts except conspiracy to commit treason. The judge sentenced the producer to 10 years in a federal penitentiary for making this film and imposed a fine of $5,000. He said that Goldstein's mistake, he said, was, quote, he sought to arouse enmity against Great Britain by seeking to prove that 100 years ago that nation had been guilty of the same class of atrocities as are now charged against the detestable Huns. Uh, next, next slide. And this is, uh, Goldstein says, I've tried to write my story as an unbiased person would. The worst I did was to blunder or use bad judgment. I am merely a lone man suffering a great wrong for no reason whatsoever. Can you refuse to help me obtain justice? I've never done the slightest thing to warrant this persecution. What in the name of common sense can be the reason for such wanton injustice? The next slide is the response of the court 
Goldstein is a bumptious ignoramus, more a fool than villain who mistook greedy aggressiveness for talent and business energy. His foot slipped when he tried to insult Uncle Sam as he had already insulted Art. A theatrical costumer, he bought stock in the birth of the nation, which is true, made a bit of money, decided to beat Griffith. He sold some of his stock, and then he says, purporting to be a transcript of the War of American Liberation, it was a 50-50 libel of the colonies and Mother England. So that's what he was prosecuted for. Next slide. Now, what he did in, in, in his film is interesting also, particularly for New Yorkers, because he not only uh, went after British brutality, including scenes of British uh, bayoneting babies and uh, killing women and so forth, you know, but also this was done around something called the Cherry Valley Massacre, which is Cherry Valley is up around um, oh, uh, Cooperstown. And the, the, what happened there, which he shows in the film, was a combination of the British uh, troops, the Loyalist troops, and the Indians, the Seneca and the Mohawk, in a massive uh, massacre uh, in that area, of the people in that area. And that's what he depicted in the film. That was not in the original script, so it's interesting why he chose that event to, uh, to demonstrate. This is the monument that was built to the people who were killed there, where they talk about the people who killed them, including the British, the Loyalists, and uh, these Indian tribes, the Seneca and the Mohawk. Next. Uh, and these are, this is a picture from the film. The British and Indians massacre the American settlers. Keep going. And these are some of the people involved from the British and uh, the, uh, the Loyalist side. One thing that happened is I went to look up something when we were driving over here just to get, uh, get something. And it was really interesting because, you know, I just did a search and the Britannica popped up. Okay, now all the other articles that popped up call it the Cherry Valley Massacre. Uh, they talk about the British, the Indians, and the, and the uh, Loyalists. But Britannica calls it the Cherry Valley, um, what is it? Incident. Incident. It's something like that. Cherry, I, I'm sorry, I don't have it, but it's a totally different word. It talks about the Indians, you know, <laughs> and it doesn't talk about the British. So, you know, typical British. You want to talk about their control of the people in the country, you know, whether it's the Indians or, you know, what they're doing with the Israelis or what they're doing with the Palestinians. I mean, they control the ability to rewrite the history. Uh, and nine times, you know, usually they're right in the middle of it. Go ahead. I won't tell you who those people are, but I will tell you who this is. That's Joseph Brandt on the far right, who was the head of the Mohawks, except he was extremely uh, integrated into the British uh, networks. And in fact, after they were wiped out. I mean, uh, there was an expedition against the Iroquois as a result of this, and they uh, left, and they were forced to move to Canada. And the Canadians in Ontario have entire dedications to Joseph Brandt. So this is not exactly what you think of when you think of uh, Native Americans or indigenous people. This is something totally different that was going on. Next. And you know, you have to hand it to Goldstein. He decided to put this in the film and he went to prison. <laughs> uh, just to show you what they knew was the power of the film at the time, this is the poster for uh, D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, which was another operation run through London to redefine the nation. I mean, this was based on a book that was called The Klansman, and, but, but when they did the film, they called it The Birth of a Nation which is very interesting to have them define what the birth of the U.S. was. It went back to the Klan. It overturned the whole success of Lincoln and the Civil War. Uh, and this, this was not, nobody was prosecuted for this. In fact, it was shown in the White House, you know, and this helped recruit for, for, the, uh, for World War I. Next. So here we are, and, you know, we've got these three points that Burroughs makes. Why didn't we know? Why didn't he know? You know, a Pulitzer Prize winning historian, why did most of us not know a lot of these kind of things that were well known at the time? He said, maybe it didn't happen. Yes, it did. Maybe it wasn't well known. Clearly it was. 
World War I, the Espionage Act, they made it illegal to attack the British, and the history books were rewritten to say there was really no big problem between us. There was a little falling out, and now we're together. What about number four? Because uh, he had another reason that Burroughs gave as to why this we don't know. And the next slide indicates that. Burroughs wrote the book at the time of Abu Ghraib. And he, and he wrote it about the way prisoners were being treated during the revolution. And he said at the beginning of the book, I'm not telling you what to think, but at the end of the book he said maybe one reason we don't know is because we've become so much like them. Next slide. So that's his book. And uh, next slide. And we have to compare it and uh, to again, when he asks the question, which a number of these historians do, which is who really fought the American Revolution? And when people say, you know, they attacked the revolution, they don't talk about the people who fought it. And they don't talk about the percentage that were Irish, which had a big reason not to want to do anything with the British. Uh, one of the monuments at the Fort Greene Park w is, was put in by the Spanish government because of the number of uh, Spaniards that died in the revolution, including on the, the, the ships. As uh, Ben Franklin himself said, this is the plebeian honor of the common man who rose against oligarchy and were willing to give their lives to do it. Uh, and this, this is the idea that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the next slide. And the other point that uh, is made, that these United Colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. So that's the Declaration. So I think those, I think that's it. But um, again, there's a lot in here about the actual rewriting of the history books, which is useful to look at, because how do you get a revolution, a, a commitment against oligarchy, people willing to die on prison ships at the rate that they were willing to die, and then turn around and say, really, there's no beef between us. We can work together. And as we saw today in the UN, we are. We voted against the resolution, and the British abstained. There's no war we've been in since the end of the Cold War that the British were not our close ally and uh, impetus. So we have to break from that. OK. Do you want to join us? You're staying here, right? I think we can open it up for questions. I have a lot of thoughts. I think this is really maybe, excellent. Maybe we can have people come up one by one if they have a question, or do we want We can pass this to them, right? Oh. Any questions, thoughts? <coughs> I, it's certainly striking the brutality of the British in this war. That is really striking. And nobody knows it. What? Go ahead. I I have a thought. I wrote something in my notes that I thought was kind of compelling. Um, that seven or 1917 was literally a violation of our Declaration of Independence, and I think that's something. Like my family back home in Texas, like they can kind of see they can kind of see that, and like everyone looking at the Biden administration, they kind of see like America they're just looking for something you know they're looking everyone's politically homeless so it's kind of cool like Americans seem to be waking up mm -hmm. I want to say no I, I think it's true I mean most of the, most of these wars uh, the sit the people were never asked I mean we're in wars right now and you're in an oligarchical situation I mean the whole idea of self-government uh, that the purpose, the creation of government is with the consent of the governed, it, it no longer functions. And uh, yeah, it is a violation 
of, of the Declaration of Independence. There was a lot of opposition to it at the time. The U.S. was shifting. I mean, in 1898, you had the uh, Spanish-American War. The U.S. was becoming part of the British Empire idea, you know, establishing empires in certain areas. There also was, during that period, the beginning of a, a real emphasis on eugenics, you know, on, on the so-called science of racism. Uh, and one of the things that they discussed with eugenics was they said, well, there's dysgenics, which are people who should be sterilized or should not be allowed to reproduce because they have bad genes, and it'll bring down the quality of the genetic pool. But there's also aristogenics, and you can breed an aristocracy. <laughs> now, <laughs> That's why yeah, and this was, this was heavily promoted. It was at Harvard, it was at Yale. I mean, it was, in fact, one of the people we've worked with, uh, Will Happer, who, who's done all this work about the fraud of uh, client global warming, you know, and, and that CO2 is destroying the environment. He compared it to this. He said it's like the eugenics movement. It had the backing of all the so-called experts in universities, and it was supposedly a science. Uh, but it's a similar thing. So you had this shift going on, but there was real opposition to it. Big opposition, like opposition to the wars, you know, there was opposition from the population. And it's true that the move into World War I and what it took to accomplish that, and then doing something like the Espionage Act to threaten people if they opposed it, you know, this was a, a critical move to try to crush uh, you know, the, the, the people who actually realized that, that something really bad was happening in the shift of American mentality. Yeah? So we saw from the presentation that the Americans were, they, they were knowledgeable about their identity and who they were up until World War I, um, especially with... Um, in 1908, when the when the uh, prisoner ship uh, memorial was erected, and Howard Taft went up, pr who was president, went up and called the British atrocities for what they were. In just short order, you saw a shift in the American identity from into something that's Anglo-Saxon with the outbreak of World War One. And the this Anglophilia that just over over there's just overwritten everything. Now, what would you say is the relevance of the post civil well post Second American Revolution as we call it, the so called Civil War? There were operations at run run like with the uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest and the uh, Ku Klux Klan, and then that culminated in the release of the Birth of the Nation movie, which. Which what you alluded to was an operation by the British to shift knowledge of of the American identity from one thing to the Anglo-Saxon racial identity, which then made our entry into World War One palatable or deemed necessary by the Wood, by Woodrow Wilson and his Anglophile gang. Um, what are some other factors, uh, perhaps from over time, that has led to the Brain, you know, the, the gradual shifting of the American uh, thinking in that. I think, first of all, I, I, don't, I don't think that everything was fine up to World War I. Mm -hmm. I mean, because, you know, uh, we had presidents assassinated. We had, we had to, you know, we had to have a civil war, you know. I mean, uh, the, the country was being divided. We had slavery, uh, which was being supported. You know, I mean, there was opposition, but it was it was a dominant institution in the country. I mean, we were screwed up in different ways, but I think the difference. Uh, and one of the people who wrote about this, uh, Tony Chaikin, who was one of our early historians with the LaRouche organization, he wrote this book called Treason in America. And what he does in this is he says that you had the Tories and the British influence was always here, uh, and then you had the ideas of the American Revolution, but it's kind of what I said at the beginning. You don't really win a war just because you win the, the fight on the battlefield. It's a question of the mind, and it's a question of the culture. And, and there's a constant uh, fight of this oligarchical principle to retain control of the mind and retain control of the culture. And 
I mean, the, you know, the, the, we had severe problems. That's why Lincoln did what he did. I mean, he, he was, uh, yeah, he said you had to have a second American Revolution, which we did do. Uh, but what happened with 1917, particularly in terms of the current situation of kind of wiping out the memory of a lot of things that had occurred in the revolution and the use of the, of the uh, Espionage Act to do it, I mean, that's like really, uh, you know, it's, it's a very centralized attack on any opposing view. And it really does introduce the Anglo, you know, the Anglophile element at a, a higher rate, I think. That's what, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think Lincoln was right. You know, we, we hadn't really won it completely, and we still haven't won it, and that's what our challenge is. I mean, our challenge is not to say America right or wrong. Our challenge is to say what are the principles of the revolution and how do we actually win it? How do we win the revolution which was started but not completed and which has been, it, it's been, a, they've been able to reverse it at certain points how do you define what the principles actually are and then be willing to do what those people on the ship were willing to do, is, which is die for them? Uh, that's what, what winning the revolution would actually be all about. And we haven't done it yet. Oh, okay. I just want to say a couple of things and then there's another question. One, people here may or may not be aware that the number one quote unquote slander against LaRouche was that he said the Queen of England pushes drugs. Why was that considered so bad? In other words, that was, it was clear it was the British and actually the whole legal case against Lynn began. We got the letter from Henry Kissinger to the head of the FBI saying do something about LaRouche in 1982, but we know that prior to that there was a secret cable from British intelligence that we still don't have. And I think it's, it's really important, this thread of the fight of Joan of Arc, Nicholas of Cusa, the question of that if God is perfect and man is in the image of God, then man must be worthy of self-government. And what does that mean? This conception of the consent of the government. And this, this was a philosophical battle going over many generations, over centuries. And that is the principles reflected in our Declaration of Independence and Constitution, which is very good. And I love the idea in the Constitution to form a more perfect union. Because right there, it tells you it's not done that this is a process, that it is the nature of man, and, and you see it in Helga Zeppelarusha's 10th principle, that man is capable of limitless self-perfection. So the nation is dedicated to that, and, and that is the real goodness of the place. It's not a thing, it's an intention to strive for a particular idea of what a perfect government will be which we will never get we will never get to but we can correct all of these problems and uh, this is why I think in George Washington's farewell address he also stresses so much the question of education religion culture because in our republic the citizens have an enormous amount of power and if we don't understand what our nation represents then we lose it and you see we have thoroughly be this was not an accident this was completely by design the united states is now doing everything the british empire did everything wait adrian's next uh, i wanted to I want to ask a question about uh, like culture and actually the English language itself because I feel like um, there's a strain of political thinkers I've encountered who seem to believe that the, re the way that the British are able to kind of wield this power is because they are the original users of the English language. That's where the language was born so that they 
kind of just somehow have this ability to manipulate language and change the meanings of words or ideas that we that and that we're just kind of we live downstream of that so like we're just kind of dealing with with those machinations um and then just looking at like american culture pop culture there's this sort of fascination with british people uh we kind of view them as like having this magic pixie dust like they're so smart or something like on like american idol there's that british judge who's like supposed to be the really smart guy or something and then um there's all sorts of examples there's the cooking show where they find like restaurants that aren't doing well and they're like we'll bring in this british chef gordon ramsay and he'll like figure out how to fix the situation um oh didn't know that okay yeah <laughs> yeah um yeah look up any like sh popular show there's probably more british actors than you would realize i remember looking up the cast of the hbo john adams show it's like all british people basically um or like the cast of Band of Brothers is another one, another HBO show. Uh, so I was just, yeah, it's just kind of like, what I don't know, what do you think about this? And is there something, is, is, is in some way, is it the problem just the language itself? Oh, well, I think, actually, I mean, this is why, this is why we have to study Shakespeare, because there were English speakers who were in a battle against oligarchism and and actually this is why noam chomsky is so rotten and evil rotten and evil everybody out there all you leftists who like noam chomsky because he wanted to get rid of metaphor and irony and that's the power just as mathematics is only a skeleton it's not life it can never express perfectly physics words can never perfectly express an idea but the words can create a by what they don't say by what's not said they can cause you to have an idea and i think the english language itself and I don't know, unfortunately, Sanskrit or some languages that are considered, or, and maybe this is why Schiller said that everyone should learn ancient Greek. I think how deprived we are, actually, and how stupid we are in our education system. But I think the language itself has a great deal of potential. We are destroying it, though, lately. And the social media, like the limitations on how many characters you can use, like X and things like that are really destroying the language and also to develop to develop a metaphor um, well I was gonna say it does sometimes take a few words it sometimes might take more than 180 characters but not but I think that's why you want to study people like Jonathan Swift and Shakespeare and explore the the rebels who were fighting oligarchism in this language, Chaucer, that's ancient, I mean, that's a funny kind of English, and Americans uh, who were patriots. But it is an important question, and it is interesting I, it, that you actually did that work, because you definitely have the sense we're all made to worship the Brits. Everyone thinks the accent sounds intelligent or something, I don't know. So, Art, you want to? I wanted to uh, take up a little bit of a different theme, but this has to do with the cultural destruction of the country. I mean, a lot of what we are identifying about the cause of the cur current crisis is that the Anglo-American financial system is bankrupt. They're not accepting the BRICS or other groups coming together with a new system. They were defending their whole mon monetary system. And the idea of money being some kind of principle of value, if we think back to the early days of the United States, the, the key to success was things like Ben Franklin making discoveries in electricity, or Thomas Edison, or the building of railroads and steam engines, or the Wright brothers later on. But one of the turning points, I think, was at the end of Grant's administration, they were forced to get rid of the, gold, the greenback system with this uh, Specie Resumption Act. 
And that, came, that brought in the whole era of the robber barons, people who thought they could become so super wealthy just by stealing everything. And that became the definition of what success was, as opposed to being an inventor or discoverer, somebody who actually would solve problems and cause success to the benefit of humanity, right? And um, I guess the last president who actually had that Lincoln spirit, if he wasn't perfect, was McKinley. He was a Civil War veteran. He was about to give a speech about building the railroad connection from across the Darien Gap to South America, and he gets assassinated that day up in Buffalo. And then who comes in as vice president? Teddy Roosevelt, who is an Anglophile. He's a friend of Edward VII, <laughs> you know. And that led to the, the later on, the Wilson crowd coming in. But anyway, the idea that the culture has been so defined that success is making a lot of money, not producing something of value for, ma for mankind. That's sort of the, you know, if people had that idea that their mission in life was to do something that was valuable for mankind, we wouldn't be accepting any of this crap, you know? Right. That gets to the way I wanted to conclude it, but let me see if Suzanne has something. Do you? I was just thinking about the language. Yeah, please think through this. <laughs> Because uh, I was just thinking about, uh, you know, about uh, Teddy Roosevelt in Puerto Rico, you know, and the, and the Spanish-American War. And they did force the people in Puerto Rico to learn English, and they didn't know it. And, you know, it was a form of, uh, you know, of control. It's, it's just an interesting idea. I hadn't really thought about it. Uh, and you do have the English-speaking union, which is something that, they had established, you know, of a collaboration among nations and so forth. It's an interesting idea. I, I was just thinking about it. But otherwise, um, yeah, I think the, uh, yeah, five eyes. We have to win the American Revolution. That's <laughs> basically the idea. And so this is just the first. We want to have a couple of, uh, you know, subsequent discussions on what exactly that means to win the American Revolution. I mean, what happened, but, you know, how do, how do we win it? I mean, what is it? you know, what, what actually are the principles involved? Uh, I mean, as we all know, the U.S. is totally unique. I mean, we have people from all over the world. Queens has, what, 161 languages just in Queens alone. Uh, they have the Endangered Language Organization, which some, some people speak languages here in the United States, and they don't speak them in, you know, anywhere else. I mean, it's an incredibly unique country, and the revolution was won by common people, you know, who were willing to do what they were willing to do. It's, it wasn't an, a, an aristocratic grouping. Uh, so we have a, a great tradition, and it, it has been the case. I was talking to one of the people um, who was taking care of a lot of the uh, migrants who were coming in. You know, he was telling me the other day that, you know, it takes him all his time. He has 151 migrants from West Africa sleeping on the floor of his majid. Um, and he said the reason they came, he said they sold everything they had, they've got nothing, uh, they're getting sick, he has to raise money every day for them, and he said, you know, sometimes people give you a contribution, and it's nice, but, you know, they want to eat again the next day, too, you know, so you have to do it continuously. He said that the thing that happened is he said people are chasing peace. And I had, you know, it's an interesting thing. He said it's not money, it's peace. It's the ability to have the circumstances in which you can live, you can thrive, you can use your talents and make something out of them, and you can work, uh, you can bring up a family. And if you look at the world right now, there's very few places where that exists. And, uh, you know, that was his idea of coming to the United States. And what we represent, even though what we're doing by going with the British is disgusting, and we're doing exactly what we're accusing people of doing in, in, uh, in, in uh, Israel and Gaza, that if, the, if you're using Nazi tactics and they're being used by the people who were destroyed by the Nazis, it has a particular horror to it. And if we as Americans are, are using the tactics of the people we won the revolution against, including the brutality, the wars, the overthrow of governments, it's, it's a particular victory for them which we shouldn't give them. We should continue the revolution, and we should assert uh, the actual difference, and we should win it. 
So that's what I have to say. Okay, good. I just wanted to share something from Mr. LaRouche in conclusion. I also can't help but respond to a comment here when you brought up the migrants and the difficulty of some of our friends who have them all on the floor of the uh, mosque, uh, who writes, deport them all. Uh, that That is completely inhumane. As soon as you say that, as soon as you say any group of human beings is no longer worthy of life, then you're saying life is not a fundamental principle of natural law. That doesn't mean that our immigration system is not completely broken and that we don't have to regulate the border and have the resources to vet people and provide proper medical care and teach English and all of the things we have to do. What the migrant crisis exposes is the other utter bankruptcy of the nation. We had 100,000 homeless children in the New York City public schools prior to bringing in 100 and I don't know how many it is now, 59,000 homeless migrants. So obviously we, ha we don't have the capacity to deal with our own population by design and what, what Art was saying in terms of the money, think about it. We have by far the largest military budget in the world, by far. And we can't even produce enough shells for the Ukrainian army. And the Russians are now outproducing the U.S. and all of NATO combined. Now, why is that? because we'd much rather have the money than the production, yep. right? That's the issue. If we were gonna build uh, 43,000 miles of new high-speed rail, that would employ 800,000 people. We don't have 800,000 people in this country right now prepared to do that work, right? These are the questions we have to solve. If our nation had a mission, we would be digging in every single person to look for the talent that they could contribute to that mission. We wouldn't want to throw anyone on the scrap heap. But we don't have a mission right now. And that's to go back to what I said, unless we can win this fight, unless we can reverse this takeover by the British Empire, our nation is done. We are very close to done. We are like this close. But it's not like we don't have what we need or the knowledge isn't there. And, and to that end, I just want to share this incredible um, quote from Lyndon LaRouche's paper on the essential role of the concept of victory, because I think it gets at actually exactly what we're discussing. He says, the purpose of statecraft is not some set of contractual agreements to keep peace among the lions and lambs of this planet. In such an arrangement, the lions, the jackals, and the hyenas will peacefully enjoy their bloody feast of lambs. The purpose of statecraft, including strategy, is the development of the individual in a manner consistent with the fact that the divine spark of potential for Socratic reason in the individual is that aspect of man which is in the image of the living creator. A stagnant end to bloody quarreling and oppression on this planet is a futile dream of utopia fit only for the useless dreaming of the lower beasts, not for mankind. Man's purpose will always remain expressed in a manner consistent with the famous 28th verse of the first chapter of Genesis. Useful labor, characterized by such advances in the productive powers of labor as obtained through scientific and technological progress. The purpose of peace is to enable us to devote our energies more fully to such tasks. So that from Lyndon LaRouche, who is probably the quintessential American and has the most had the most profound understanding of the American Revolution of anybody I ever knew. And with that, we will conclude.
the live stream. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Oh, wait, one thing. Thursday, speaking of culture, the December 14th is a concert of the Schiller Institute NYC Chorus. It's at 7 p.m. at Good Shepherd Church, which is 152 West 66th Street. You can visit uh, the Schiller Institute, what is SI? Schiller Institute, S I N Y C Chorus dot com website for information on the concert. Speaking of culture, so I hope we see you there. And with any luck, we will see you next week. Thank you.